what were some of the questions you asked yourselves when you decided, is this, is this, do I want to be a performer first and foremost? Or is that how you guys even consider yourselves? Yeah, I think we're definitely entertainers. I mean, you know, for, for me, there was definitely a time, a point not long after the storm where we were, we were in the van traveling from a festival to go to another gig, and, and it was just awful. The, the, the situation was horrible. We knew the next gig was going to be bad that night, and I was, like, for me, I was thinking, all right, well, tomorrow when I quit this band, what am I going to do? Like, who am I going to play with? And the first people that, I, that came to my mind as far as who to, who to play with were these guys. So, it's like, I mean, Dave's a pretty good bass player. Maybe I'll call him next week, you know? <laughs> Thanks, so, buddy. I mean, it's, 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 it's more, yeah, no problem. It's so, sorry, no, please finish. What else are we going to do, you know? I mean, not, not necessarily like we couldn't do anything else, but, I mean, things get ratty. I don't know. I mean, it's cool to hear all these announcements about y'all having all these bands, because when I was here, I don't really remember that being that many bands, you know? It's great that there's so many people, like, already doing what they hope to do after they get out of school, you know? And I, I think that's really important. And there's horrible moments <laughs> of, of self-doubt and, like, this sucks. This is the worst decision <laughs> I ever made, but, it, it, but it's like, what else are you gonna do? Some of us are just meant to play music, and for better or for worse, you kinda just find your way through it. I, I mean, I think that's sort of the, it's probably helpful with as many bands as there are in the world today to have a little bit of adversity to prove that you really wanna do it, and that you really mean it, and you're not just there for the chicks and free beer. Or whatever. Can we, can we, I hate to say this, but for the webcast, can you please, we gotta get a microphone oh, on you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. And you have a great voice, oh, it fills thanks. the room. Well, thank you. No, I just, I was just saying that you know, there's a lot of tough moments as a, a touring band, especially. They're really emotionally draining. You know, you miss your girlfriend and your bed and all that stuff. But, you know, if it's, if it's really what you're meant to do, it's worth it. And the people in your life that you're missing, if they really care about you, are down to, to put up with all that ridiculousness. And it's good for, I think it's good for a band. It kind of proves that you're, that you're in it to win it, you know. So how did, how did the touring, I mean, that's been where you guys have uh, spent a lot of your time. Uh, can we talk a little bit about how how you guys started touring and sort of what it means now and how that's changed? We started touring just just calling every club whose number we could find. And Harry, who used to be in the band, who also went to Loyola with us, just like <laughs> badgered them into giving us gigs. I mean, really, there was no like high scientific method. And there still isn't one, by the way. If you're a new band and you want to tour, you just call them and call them again and keep calling them and they're going to ignore you like almost all the time, and eventually someone will give in and you'll get a gig. And the first tour you do, you're going to burn a lot of gas and you're not going to make any money. And if you're like us, you'll be stealing the cheese samples from Whole Foods, and <laughs> which we had to do they're, on the last they're day They're free, our first so tour. they're not stealing. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you take like 60 of them, I think that's kind of stealing. <laughs> One little toothpick worth is all right, man. I was like filling my pockets with them, but. Yeah, you know, but that's that stuff's fun when you're 21. I mean, if that happened to me now at 31, I think I'd be a little bummed out. But so, <laughs> so, so your needs change. You know, you're not, you don't want the same things you did when you yeah, were. Yeah, but 40. that's the part. Of, that's like the arc of it, man. Like you were asking how you get started. I think you start out just like three point stance, like look out world, here I come, young and stupid, and you just charge into the into the mist, and you'll get somewhere like that. But eventually, like. You, you get a little more reward for it, and it's, you don't have to put up with cheese samples at Whole Foods. You can get, like, the, the, <laughs> the ever-elusive sandwich tray backstage <laughs> with the pimento cheese sandwich. Who eats those, man? <laughs> but, yeah, like, the little things, they start kind of adding up. It gets better as you go along. But the beginning is just, like, guerrilla warfare, whatever it takes. Like, if you have to go to the booking agent's house and, like, beat on the door, just do it. What's some advice you'd give about building a, about expanding your fan base? And, you know, you're in some town or some city where you didn't think you'd be or, 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 or you know, it's your first time there. What are some of the tactics you guys have learned to sort of increase the people who are in the Giants Guest Dirty Notes Club? Omar? Increasing fan base? Yeah. What, 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 what's worked for you guys? What tactics? I, I think <laughs> a lot of prayer, sure. Well, I think uh, I think that uh, getting people to come to your show in a new town is just 
that there, there's absolutely no way to like guarantee that. I mean, you know, it also always helps to know somebody and that person, you know, kind of word of mouth gets other people to come to your show. But it, what, what I thought your question was about was how do you maintain it? Well, let, I mean, let's start with, let's start with just that. How do, you, how do you take people who are at a club for music to, oh, I'm a fan of this band, or oh, I may see them at a next show, I may buy you their music. You rock them. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, actually, right. that's actually, Dave's, Dave's answer is correct. You rock yeah, them. I mean, I mean, getting them in the room is the hard part. Uh -huh. uh, once they're in the room, you know, it's up to you and, and kind of the, sounds cheesy, but the passion with which you perform in front of them will determine if they come back or not. I think as far as getting them in the room, you know, you, you check out, I mean, we're kind of a New Orleans sounding band. We have the horns and, you know, first question is, you know, there's people around the country that love New Orleans music. How do we reach those people? And, um, you know, I think, I think you guys grew up with Facebook and Twitter a little more than we did. We were just introduced to it a few years ago and that's, I mean, that's invaluable. Uh, but I think college, college radio stations, public radio, the gambits of the country, the offbeats of the country, you know, you just have to find what those are in each city. And you just, like, like you said, for booking gigs, you have to aggravate them. If they ignore you, you got to call them back. If they keep ignoring you, you got to call them, you got to aggravate them. Yeah, and also don't, don't underestimate the power of, of a network of, like, close friends who can get their friends out. Like if you, have, if you have a few friends in a city and they get their friends out, like you can fill out a small venue. So um, networking is, is crucial for anything. Yeah, and, so. and New, in New Orleans, I, you know, we basically grew up here and you kind of take it for granted how much music there is in the city. And I was surprised when we started touring that there's people who are so hungry for live music and it, it's not that common in certain cities. So if people know that there's this event going on at this small club, you'll have the place flooded with people. Yeah, I, I've noticed that like a lot of bands that are touring want to go to, they all want to go to like New York and LA and, and you know, the Austin and like the big, everyone thinks that if you can make it there. But the truth is, I think for us, we've had really good success in really weird places where you show really? up like, it kind of dried up because I don't know, maybe they don't like us anymore. But for a while we were doing <laughs> great in Boone, North Carolina. Because we rolled into town, and it's a hip little town, and they were all about it, and they went bananas for it. But if you go into New York, they're like, yeah, who, I mean, who are you? What, why do we care? There's 4,000 bands playing tonight. Same thing with Austin. I mean, yeah, it's awesome. If, if you're loved in Austin, that is quite an achievement, but you're just like one of a 1,000 groups any given night. So kind of being, I guess maybe in regards to your question as far as expanding your audience, like finding markets that aren't as obvious as the big ones that everyone thinks they, they need to play, you know? Mm. But you guys put the time in on the personal level. Like, um, like you, you, you knew, okay, we have Jimmy, we have Tommy and, and Francis in this city. So let's be sure to tell them that we're coming and that we have a show and if they can bring any of their friends. What was, was that, was that something yeah, like we that? Yeah, we still do that. I mean, I still think, you know, a month out before we go on the road, I'll, I'll go down the list of everybody in my phone and all these towns that we're going to. And okay. To call them, you know? I think also, uh, you know, I mean, mailing list. The mailing. Yeah, I have a mailing list. If, if you know, the Beatles could could get back together and play, but if nobody knew about it, it'd be an empty room. You know, you gotta let people know. You gotta let. You know, mailing list is hugely important. I think uh, the social media thing is sort of a, like a double-edged sword too. Like, I mean, you know, you can. Like it's really great to have Facebook to to contact all these people and say like, come to our show, come to our show, but. Uh, you know, if somebody hasn't seen you, the first thing they're going to do is go to YouTube and look you up. And, you know, there are like a million awful clips of us on YouTube. So, I mean, there are some really good ones too. Um, but, you know, like there's a responsibility, like, like when Dave was saying earlier, you know, you, you have to rock, like you really have to rock, like you really have to perform at like your highest level as, as, as much, as, you know, the best, to the best degree you can that day, because somebody's taping you, somebody's got their phone out, uh, you know, and like that may that 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 you know that kids uh, who's filming you that may be like what gets five more people to your next show. So if you know mm. if, if you suck, you know you may you may we have lost out. We didn't really have YouTube when we started. I don't I don't, I don't yeah. think that was no, it didn't a, exist an issue at all. So yeah, man, honestly, like you, 
at your rehearsals, some dude's probably standing outside and filming it and putting it on as like this band I heard. So it really is like everything you do has to. There's nowhere to hide anymore, I guess. I mean, is what he's saying. And really, like we'll do shows for three or four people, but if the right three or four people are there, then I don't know. It's like a, the good lesson to learn is there's we've seen bands that they have a small crowd and they play like they have a small crowd. And could you could you maybe explain weak. that a little bit more? That seems like a well, like Tina Turner said, she's like, if I play for five people or five thousand people, I do the same exact show, because how do you know that like a record executive isn't in the crowd? How do you know that the bartenders? brother, who's like the bartender, the only guy in the crowd at our Philly show the first time we were there. How do we know that like he doesn't have a friend who owns a great club and you just don't know. And it's kind of arrogant to assume that a small crowd is no good, you know. If you got five people that paid, they paid the same as any one of those 5,000 people would have, so they deserve a good show. Now if there's literally zero people in the crowd, then that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> then you just, you know. Rehearse. Yeah, just play for whoever. Right. Yourself. Um, one of the things that I think you guys have done a great job of is finding your stage presence. I know a lot of people, um, a lot of people get told that if they want to, if they want to win people over, they have to be really loud and really showy, and that doesn't work for everyone, you know. But I think you guys have found a way to really make people comfortable when you play. Um, how did you find what worked and what didn't work, didn't work? And 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 if you had to, if you had to maybe explain that to some other bands, what what would you tell them? You know, how do you make your audience comfortable? That's maybe a better way to phrase that. Like, I mean, at least for my part as a singer, I try to, I try to just look at people, and if they're like, they look really bored or really offended, then I backpedal and do something else. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think maybe as music students, we kind of th feel like this air of superiority, sort of like an academic thing. I, I mean, I'm not. That sounds bad, but you know what I mean. Like. As a player, you're like, this is what I do. Deal with it. You know, I'm a visionary, and we were kind of like that. <laughs> but but if people aren't into it, man, like, what's the good of it? You could you could play in your garage for your buddy, you know, or you can go out on the road and try to make people happy. I think being an entertainer, you you just kind of have to listen to what people say. I mean, lately we've had people giving us feedback, and it's tough to have people say, I liked you guys, but even though the but might be something totally, you know, worth listening to. Like the other guys, the other day, some guy said to me. You guys were awesome. Uh, I just wish there was more cello. And I said, "Oh, well, that's good advice. You know, that that's something we want to know because if our fans are are into that, then why not give it to them? I mean, what good does it do us to be like, no, man, this is all you the cello you're gonna get? <laughs> <laughs> no more cello, bro. My arm is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you guys have made a pretty clear distinction to call yourself entertainers. You know, I know a lot of people, and it's sort of, sort of along the same lines of what we're talking about now. Is that? I mean, how would you how would you define that? Bass player. I'm probably the worst one to ask about <laughs> this. I'm the one that has my head down the whole time. Um, I guess, you know, at, at the beginning, it was definitely a visual thing, and, and we made sure we had, you know, costumes, and we made a, a visual statement. Um, you know, now we've kind of put our heads down, and we're, we're, you know, we're more into the musical part of it, but... But like Mark says, you know, your job is to entertain people. And if there's one person in the crowd that's not digging it, then, it, you know, you need to focus on that one person. You don't need to focus on the girl that's taking her bra off and throwing it in your face. <laughs> All right, maybe a little bit. But, uh, you know, that's a tough question. Uh, entertaining is something that I guess I don't, think too much about I just kind of play and hope that it's entertaining I don't know <laughs> I, I think for for us as horn players I mean I, I don't I know that for myself I feel like uh, you know I mean we we both went to like jazz school uh, you know I mean as much as as much as like we want to you know play like our best our best you know bag of licks and all that kind of stuff there's still a responsibility to not get too far over an audience's head. I mean, we're not, I, you know, in our respect, we're not entertaining like, you know, we're not like dancing around for them, that kind of stuff, but we're still, we can't like disengage from the fact that people are listening to us and, you know, just play like all the headiest stuff we can play. You know, we still have to, you know, we still have to play something that's accessible to an audience. So, I mean, you know, we're not, we're not making art, but we're, you know, but, you know, I mean, the entertainment part of it is just that we're, you know, we're still engaging with the audience. We're not, we're not trying to like play something above them. 
Yeah, and we were, I mean, all of us met here, and we were either doing classical or jazz, and those two types of music aren't exactly dance friendly. I mean, you could argue that they are, but, um, I, you know, we set out the dirty note thing is because we wanted to play wrong notes and say, screw you, we're playing wrong notes on purpose, and we're going to play them loud, and we're going to put a lot of distortion on them. And God bless America. That's right. right. They're, they're dirty notes. They're right. not wrong notes. Right. I think it's an opening and question. Um, like, you can entertain somebody by doing antics, or you can entertain them by talking to them. Like, there's a million ways to entertain someone. And I think what's important is just being honest, you know, like, and even in a band, you, you, you encounter that on a personal level, like, like, what are you personally doing in the band, and like, how are you, I guess, reconciling your responsibility as a band member, and then, you know, your own responsibility to yourself, like, if you're trying to do something that you don't feel, or something unnatural, then people will pick up on that really easily, so, I mean, I don't know, you just need to find your, you know, your own way, and as long as you're thinking about the audience and trying to make a connection, then I guess you'll, you know, they'll probably be more entertaining than not, somehow. We're going we're gonna to open it up for questions uh, in a minute. So if anyone has any questions, please come up to the front here. We'll have to do a mic handoff of some sort. Uh, but we'll, we'll work it out. I wanted to ask you guys um, on uh, sort of something that I've been very curious about. Uh, and as the forum moderator, I'm going to take a privilege and veer off to ask it. Uh, what I wanted to know is what's the etiquette for, uh, could you give some, from your experience, what are the ground rules for being a visiting band um, when you're being hosted by some other band? So your, your, your I mean, do, do you have to stay for their set? I mean, just what, what are some things you've seen you've, that have happened, or hasn't happened, that you, we should just externalize for people getting in this world? You know, I the, think, the unwritten you know, rules whether, and this sort of stuff. Whether you stay for the set depends on what your, what your schedule is. You know, right, of course. Sometimes we'll open for a band and we have a long drive, so we'll leave or another band will open, we'll do a show with another band and, and you know they have to drive right after the show you know that happens a lot just touring bands crossing paths or, or however it works you know right and a, um, a bad experience can stay with you I remember we played a festival in Telluride Colorado and um, uh, black the Black Crows were the headliner and they literally just jumped out their bus went straight to the stage and. They were, I remember them being very rude, you know, and uh, I'll, I'll, that's what I'll think of when I think of Black Crows, not... But they rock. They were incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they were awesome. I would, I would say make sure you announce that you're not the other band. Like, and make, sure you, make sure you announce that they're coming up, because, like, people can be confused sometimes. And it's good to keep a good relationship with other bands. That's extremely important, because you will see them on down the road constantly. Could you maybe explain, has, was that happened to you guys? Has there been a band that you played with and later on, what, what happened there? Uh, uh, actually, uh, well, I, a band that I opened for with a group of, I, I played cello in uh, when I was at Loyola, not this band, but uh, we opened for a band called Lucero and they played at Tips last night and I remembered them being kind of, well, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone in the band is here today, so I don't, want to say I mean they just were very nice to me that's all that was like 10 12 10 years ago so I just didn't go last night I was gonna go and I said no I'm not so so you know what I mean like that that seed was sown a long time ago and I didn't go to their show so I mean I, I we've been pretty lucky I don't think we've had I mean come on the black crows were kind of jerks to us I'm sure they're jerks to everybody who cares they, they were awesome I mean I, I got over it I don't think we've had too many bad experiences and we're real polite we, that's I think in general just the guys that are in this band we don't we don't have an attitude you know it, it just doesn't do you any good ever to be snobby or bossy or to treat sound guys like crap or to treat anyone at the club like crap I mean you're all working in the same club that night your your coworkers so you just try to try to set like good foundation if you because you're gonna want to go back and the last thing you want is to call a club and they go, oh, yeah, well, they brought in, you know, 75 people on a Wednesday night, which is great, but they were jerks and, you know, had all these demands that they, I mean, stupid, man. We're classical musicians. What, I want water. Like, give me waters <laughs> and a towel, maybe, if I'm feeling fancy, you know. Just being humble probably is the bottom line for us. And we, I think we've done a pretty good job. And the fact that we're probably the best band 
in the world. <laughs> Helps too. Did, uh, did anyone else have any? Did anyone have any questions that they wanted to ask? Could we? Uh, can I? Sorry. You can I use one of these, man. Yeah, that'd be good. Can we give them one of those mics? The webcast. We're very professional. I need you to leap we over those webcasts. seats, buddy. So, um, introduce yourself for those I'm playing at home. Patrick Zundel. Uh, Hi, Pat. I play in a band called City Lark, and we're a six-piece band, and you guys are a five-piece band. I was just wondering if you could talk to like the struggles of trying to get five people on tour that have different schedules. Different we had seven for a minute. Schedules. Oh, okay. Well, I, I'll, that's I'll save my brief part, and I want everyone to share. But I think there's a fine line between four and five people, and then between five and six. Because you start dealing with what size vehicle you need to travel. And <laughs> like three piece bands, you can get like a minivan and no trailer, and you're all good, unless you have, you know, four base cabinets or something obnoxious like that. But if you have five people and two of them are horns, you can get away with like one van, but you still, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? It starts like there's a fine line. Then you get up to seven, we had a bus, and it wasn't like, I mean, not like a real bus, but. <laughs> Like a, like a shuttle bus to, that you take to get your rent-a-car, you know, that kind of thing. And the wheel fell off of it. We were going 65 miles an hour, so. So there you have it. So stick with a six-piece, dude, because then your wheel won't fall off. <laughs> there it is. Anyone else want to speak to that? Uh, be friends with each other. That's extremely important. We all, we all participate in the loadout. I think that's I, 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 that's <laughs> that's really that's really been a, a shared responsibility that I don't think uh, I don't think too many bands too many bands share in, but it really helps. Nick Volts has carried my bass rig. <laughs> yeah, I'll Thank clap you, buddy. For, I'll clap for Volts for that. He's a trumpet player. That's pretty good. Can we? Thanks. Kevin Mike everybody. Holding it down. Doing the jobs of two people tonight. Hi, uh, my name's PJ. I'm in a band, and we actually also have uh, cello. We're named Something Burning. And I was just wondering, like, um, how long it took you to really figure out how to set up your instruments in the right way where it would be easy to switch? Because I saw the song you just played, you know, you had to almost instantly switch to the next instrument, and both me and the other guy in the band that do it, we switch is your, back and forth. Does your cello want to stand like that? No, well, it's not mine. It's Oh, the other dudes? Yeah. So I, mean. I don't know. I've struggled with that. I, I, I got this thing and realized I didn't even intend to put it on a stand. I just bought this online, and you cannot, if there's any cello players in the house, you cannot play this thing sitting down. It was designed by someone who's never touched a cello in their life. <laughs> you put it between your legs, man, and it sits like this. It, you have, it just doesn't work. I mean, that's what the company is folded. It doesn't exist anymore. So I just stuck it on a, that's a gym bass stand. And it worked out brilliantly. I don't know why, I just sat on there and I put the strap around and I was like, done. <laughs> so, but, but really, to answer your question, man, like, I just move as quickly as I can and sometimes I have to throw my bow on the ground, but buy cheap bows and lots of them. Put the black hair on them because it doesn't break as often. You don't have to rosin it up as much. And just, it's an arrangement thing. You work it out in the songs. You don't do anything where it's like, then the guitar goes, dun, 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 the cello goes, da, da, da. it ain't gonna happen, dude. Yeah. It's just not. Unless you've got an extra arm or something. You just, I don't know. You seem like a smart dude. You guys will, you guys will figure it out. Yeah, PJ. And, and get a cheap one, get a cheap one. <laughs> oh, yeah, the arrangement is the big part for sure, yeah. Yeah, definitely the way you put the song together. That's funny. Thank you. Thank you, man. Good luck, I wanna hear your band. Your cello player is probably better than me, man. Where is he? <laughs> yeah. What up, dude? That cello, those cello lessons when you were a kid are getting a lot cooler, aren't they? They're paying off. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have, uh, we have time for one more question uh, before these guys wrap up. Uh, afterwards, we are having a music management workshop in the big studio with Naughty Professor. Naughty Professor is going to play a couple of their songs. That's right. I freaking love those guys. They're awesome. If you haven't seen them yet, you should, because they played at Forum. What? So if you missed them, I don't want to hear it. I haven't seen um, them yet. But, uh, well, you guys are an exception. For now, in like an hour. Yeah. Anyways, afterwards, we're going to go over to the large studio at 6.30. They're going to play some, and we're going to talk about uh, a band that's you know, going to face those same questions about leaving and touring and, and what the next steps are from some guys, some, some seasoned vets. 
But any other, any other questions before these guys? Come on up. Come on up. Take a, I know, it's, it's a, I'm sorry. Kevin, could you give that gentleman a microphone? Yeah. Um, you guys talked about uh, killing it or rocking it at your shows, and then people would come out to, and people would go to your YouTube videos. Do you guys not have recorded music, or do you like, not put it online? No, we do. Yeah. You do? Yeah. Well. We've got four CDs. Um, we actually have a music video. Wow, that's hey. nice. Um, we're about to record a, a fifth CD. Um, but, you know, I mean, just the nature of YouTube is everything is recorded. So there's like, and, and the quality doesn't represent, like if it's not, like we've got stuff up, up on YouTube that's from uh, our performance from Jazz Fest last year. And it's the video feed that went up, up on like the Jumbotron, you know, it's like really professionally done and it, it looks awesome. Yeah. But that's not necessarily what they're going to find when they, when they search you. You know, that's not yeah. the first thing they're going to look at. So there's also cell phone videos that are like overdriven and, you know, the sound is awful. And, and I got you. Would you say that like recorded music, though, is very big in uh, building a fan base? Or is it really just all about the live show? Um, you know, I, it, it's definitely important to, to have... To have albums to have merchandise for sale you know um one of i mean we have we have three re studio records and one live record and the live record sells really well okay. because it's we're a live band you know because people want to hear what you what they want to hear just your heard, live music you know? at you know high volumes i get it right yeah. right <laughs> yeah. um you know it's it's definitely i think it's i think it's very important to have live mm -hmm. or to, just to have recorded music you know Available. I mean, I, I, you can have a fo like, you know, it, it, you can have a following and not have anything, anything on an album. You know, and you can have an, an album and not necessarily have anybody come see you. I mean, yeah. so it's it's just any you know either way. I mean, you need it. You you got to have it. You know, you need you, you know if you when need somebody if nothing else, just to just something to send to to promoters and venues. You know, yeah. they like you, they're not going to hire you because they have a paragraph describing what you sound like. You know. They want to hear you. They got to hear you. Right. Music. Yeah, thank you. Cool. All right, guys, we got about 10 minutes. Could you guys play another one for us, maybe? Would that be a good way to close out this forum? I think that'd be really nice. Yeah, let's do it. Sorry, we can't do that. Thank you, guys. See you later. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's get these mic things figured out. Could you talk into that real quick and see which one? Hello, this is me. Switch it? OK. OK, that's, is, this, is this Andres? OK, All great. Right. Yeah, this is, this is definitely a lead singer mic. What are we going to hear now? All right, well, the last, the last time I played in this room before today was my senior cello recital, and it was a little different vibe than, than today, so we just, I think we're going to play a song called Biscuits and Gravy, which is maybe might end up being one of the more rocking things that's ever been played in here. I haven't heard, I don't know, I don't want to presume, but. We actually just got a, we just found a, 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 speaking of YouTube, we just found a YouTube video of a band in Japan covering this song, which is... Pretty much the coolest thing that's ever happened. Ever to us. best thing that's ever happened to us. Period.
road. So thank you guys. Thank you, Loyola. I miss you. I love you. Be sure to come to our management workshop at 6.30. That's we'll be talking and playing with the night professor. Have a good one, guys.